And with that, Dr. Kurtz will start talking about conformance technology. Wonderful. Can you guys hear me okay? I hope so. Yeah, I think you sound good. I will. Okay. Wonderful. So we, you know, we've all seen a uh, slide similar to this in a lot of presentations, but we know that knee replacements today uh, oftentimes still have uh, pain and problems that uh, that aren't uh, readily addressed with just standard implants with uh, symmetric implants that don't allow some variability based off the patient's anatomy. Uh, we know that there is residual pain from improper fit. Uh, tibial rotation it continues to be a major problem and source of both bad kinematics and also bad patellofemoral tracking. Uh, we know that uh, patients uh, have difficulties with, uh, with more uh, 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 driven emotions like uh, squatting and kneeling, uh, and they feel like their knee is unstable. Um, can we see the next slide? So you need to know how conformance really addresses these problems and how it is unique to every other implant that's out there. And the top left corner is basically uh, something that's unique just to conformance in that they match the J curves, both in the medial femoral condyle, the lateral femoral condyle, and also the trochlear groove. And there's no other implant system out there that can do that because that requires a customized uh, patient-specific femoral component. And that's one of the unique things about conformance that nobody else can even get close to. Uh, on the um, bottom left corner, you can see how um, the uh, medial femoral condyle, uh, both posteriorly, is different from the lateral femoral condyle. You can see how the tibial um, component is also customized. And all that's been like that for the last uh, nine years. And there's nothing about the identity that changes that. Uh, we still deliver the uh, customized patient-specific uh, components. And then on the far right side, what it all culminates to is basically being able to deliver the same various or oblique joint line that the patient had uh, in their native anatomy is also delivered in the actual implant itself by having the medial femoral condyle sit a little bit lower and the lateral femoral condyle sitting a little bit higher. And then the uh, same changes are reflected on the polyethylene side as well. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about the differences with the identity and how it changed from the G2 plus um, well, for, first of all, there are stem extensions that are now available on the uh, iTotal identity, and this can be available without any uh, requirement to order the stems ahead of time. Any stem, any knee replacement that you put in can now have a stem that you can put on at any time. The tibial base plates are now titanium, and you can see on the bottom right corner that the cement rail has been moved from a oval on the G2 Plus to at the very periphery of the tibial base plate. Uh, in the identity. The uh, cement rail has also been changed. For, it used to be a 0.5 millimeter uh, buildup or 0.5 millimeter pocket, and now it is a one millimeter pocket. And that cement rail also is now dovetailed, whereas before it was just a straight wall, uh, cement, uh, straight wall. And so that offers a little bit of uh, resistance in terms of the uh, implant lifting off the cement mantle. Uh, we also increase the CR, the keel size for a cruciate retaining knee to match what the posterior stabilized knee has been like for the last five years or so. And then we also introduced metal cutting guides into the patient specific eye jigs so that a surgeon who has that uh, feel of that uh, saw blade going through a metal cutting guide will be able to still have that feel and have that reproducibility in the cutting surface. Next slide. Um, the polyethylene still comes in two-piece polyethylenes or in a one-piece polyethylene. Uh, anecdotally, the surgeons who were doing all the G2 plus CR knees still tend to do mostly the two, two poly inserts. And the surgeons who were doing a lot of posterior stabilized knees who are now trying the identity CR are sticking with the one polyethylene insert. But you can pick either one. It doesn't matter. Um, and you can also choose the implant thickness that you want to ship in the kit. It's, it's optional to pick uh, whatever size polys you want to. We also increase the uh, patella. Uh, it is now a uh, thicker in oval, uh, which will hopefully improve, uh, further improve your bone coverage of your patella and uh, patella tracking uh, and elevate that patella away from your femoral component. Uh, next slide. 
Well, there's also increased uh, PCL relief on the identity total in that last view. Um, this is uh, Rob's. I'm going to turn it over to Rob. I think you're going to go through uh, this case for us. I get myself off on mute first. That would help. Uh, well, I'm glad everybody joined us today. I'm going to go through this case, and we've uh, we'll walk through the steps, and we'll try to uh, accentuate or point out the differences and uh, what we think are enhancements to the system. This is a 71-year-old that I treated for five years plus. He'd been uh, receiving visco supplementation for some time, and he got to the point where uh, global pain persisted. We couldn't control it. Um, this is really one of those uh, layup knees, but we see the classic findings of osteoarthritis with the loss of joint space, and there's osteophytes uh, in the periphery, a bit of um, HO, excuse me, a bit of, um, of um, chondrocalcinosis in the lateral compartment, and widespread degenerative changes. So this is a right knee. He, he uh, in consultation, we uh, selected uh, a, a total knee. Now, uh, my history of uh, got over 1,500 uh, CR I, I total conformist knees in, and prior to that, uh, uh, probably about 9,000 total joint replacements. And I predominantly am a CR surgeon, and I've honed my trade on that and refined it. I'm comfortable in the in the CR space. And these enhancements have really uh, allowed me to further extend the use of a CR a knee application. All right. So this is the IV that came back on it. And you notice a few differences of those of you that are uh, previous uh, iTotal users. Up in the top down here, you see that the metal cutting guide uh, is labeled. And these come in, in small, medium, large. And those uh, are high precision caps. Guide. No. You guys are hearing that feedback I'm hearing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can you, hopefully you guys can. Yeah, let's just mute everybody and then see if that helps it out. Um, anyway, the bottom line here is um, the all of the guides that have uh, key cuts on them, the distal femoral cutting guide and then the proximal tibia cutting guide, come now with an optional metal cutting guide which is captured which has answered a lot of the concerns of our surgeons so uh this is identified on the eye total you can see that and this is a, a pretty straightforward case the patient's native tibial slope is four degrees and so we'll use the five degree cutting guide there and the lateral and medial joint heights are fairly equivalent and so we won't need any additional modification although it's recommended that we pay attention to that lateral height, that if it's over seven millimeters, that uh, note to Benny, if you want to uh, a uh, chicken cut first to see if you got enough poly. I'm gonna go on that in just a bit. So on the tibial placement, that shows the placement and the rotation there. Here on the, uh, yeah, that's fine. And th those, um, we have about a two millimeter offset and uh, we'll exploit that, uh, modified various joint line with that two millimeter offset. Let's go to the next slide there. All right, these are the accentuated portions of the uh, the femoral side. And so on this, in this part, we're using a large cutting guide uh, to give us that. And we'll cut 6.3 lateral and 9.4. You can just see the offset that is dialed in on both the J curves of the femur and the position and uh, localization of the implant. This is just highly representative only with the osteophytes removed, so you can get a bird's eye view of what the main key portions are that you're cutting. All right, next. The third view, which is new to the, to the identity, is it shows you the stem extensions. And these are always 12 millimeter in diameter, and they come in 20 and 40 millimeters. And this is simply according to a surgeon preference. You'll notice in the sagittal view, there's a five degree um, posterior uh, angle to the stem as it attaches to the base plate. There's five degrees of uh, slope built into that and the keel's uh, uh, offset posteriorly. So this will show you 
if you place it at a five degree cut where that stem extension will go. Now in the CR, many of us have adopted a, a anatomic uh, slope approach to the knee. And so you wanna pay attention to using the stems. If, uh, if you have a, a tibia where you're gonna cut um, right at the, uh, at the tibial slope, let's say it's 10 degrees, you might run into the anterior cortex. Uh, this eye view will not show you that, it will just show you the five degree cut. Just, um, just go ahead and jump in. Well, anytime there's not something to add. All right, so we're, we've done the exposure and I'm doing an extended trivector approach. I've already cut the patella. And now what you're seeing here is we'll start with that F1 jig. And this really hasn't, hasn't changed. So uh, we're coring out the uh, residual uh, cartilage. And we're ensuring that we've got osteophytes that uh, connect medial and lateral. Now here's the big difference for F2 and 3. Um, so this F2, uh, 3, uh, you'll notice that there's a metal cutting uh, guide with, buried within the ballistic nylon. It has a more pleasing, gratifying fit. And so I've moved up to the top and I'm going to pin those, uh, that metal guide through the ballistic nylon guide. And at that point, after we do that, we can remove that. One of the changes with the identity is you can actually cut with the F3. I'd still attach to F2 if you want to. If you just want added security and stabilization of your F2 guide, you can leave F3 attached and still cut through F2. And that's a nice added feature. So we're going to go through my workflow and just take it off. And uh, here I slide it off. And um, take, take off the F1. And you'll see here the, uh, we just slide that ballistic nylon right off and there is our, our pinned distal femoral cutting guide. You'll notice that there's printed, I'm gonna cross pin it here in this position. I'm gonna use the captured guide for this part of the demonstration. But you'll notice that line marked on the front open and if you want to use an open captured technique or non-captured technique you can go ahead and before you cross pin this just move it into that uh, zero position and you can cut on the outside now i'm not i've not been a capture guide user and i was very pleased with the fidelity of this cutting guide i was pleased with how well it captures the blade this is a designed for a 1.27 blade which is standard in most ors it's one side is down from the thickest uh, that, uh, width. Anyway, we'll just cut right through. And, and I take time on that distal femoral cut. This is my technique where I think this is the most important cut of the femur first technique where that distal femoral cut, we don't want to revisit that. We don't have to, we don't want to second guess that that's off plan. Sometimes this bone is really hard in younger patients and it can skive the blade. So this increases and enhances the fidelity of the, of the distal femoral cut. So once we've done that, we're really happy with that. We're gonna to move to this F4 cutting guide, which has not been changed. And um, these two alignment holes are reestablished once again. And when I position it in the zero alignment position, you'll find that um, the cross pin is, uh, will put in place. We've marked the zero to five, and you can add external rotation here if you need to. I strongly caution those that uh, that I consult with not to uh, vary that rotation there. This is an anatomic system. It's built uh, anatomically on the femur and the tibia. And so we want to join those together, unless you have a real good reason to add external rotation, strongly, strong caution against that. Now here are these push pins that'll stabilize it, depending on how many assistants you have. And we'll just complete these cuts through the F4. An anterior cut uh, followed by the the posterior condyles. And then this F4 guide, will take those push pins out after we cut the posterior feet and uh, finish up with that last cut. So here I'm cutting the feet now.
We'll complete that first chamfer cut through the F4 guy. Again, just uh, here, if uh, we had a little better view, you'd see me really laying into that uh, cortical bone that's in the notch. It tends to be really hard and can cause uh, a little bit of abnormality there when the uh, trials fit. Just lay in that with the saw. We'll finish with a, uh, a combined F5, F6 cutting jig. And um, this is one nice change. We used to have ballistic nylon arms that came up. They were cumbersome. We now have this metal rod that I'll show you as I slide it in. And this is a much uh, more accurate and uh, gratifying kind of fit there. Your assistant can hold that down, ensure that doesn't toggle off a position. As we finish up the, the uncaptured uh, cut first here, then we'll follow it with the, with the captured cut to finish off our our six chamfer distal femoral preparation. All right, here's an enhancement now. We prepared the femur. We're now going to move into the tibia. Now, in the past, this has been the least accurate uh, in my hands. And so this uh, cutting guide has been enhanced considerably. We still it still requires removal of the cartilage. We mark the back of those feet, the label where the cartilage has to be removed. There's a number of techniques to do that. But what's nice is that drop rod. It slides through the hole. And you can see here, we're going to identify the osteophytes that key that in that confirm that those feet and that cutting guide is where it belongs. We're going to pin that, but we have the, the double check assurance of that drop rod, which traditionally will drop right to the second ray. Uh, and um, it's more accurate, more, more gratifying. This is a five degree uh, slope cutting guide. So that will be off there. So here, here we go now again, example of this metal cutting guide. So we're gonna, we're gonna pin it through the zero and this is for the use of the captured guide, the blade through the capture. With the open, we could just move that down to those open pins and uh, move our blade on top of uh, that open non-captured. You'll notice, I'll just give you a preview after we've cut right through that guide. Then um, I can also remove that guide and uh, just have the metal cutting guide there if I want to visualize the bone that I'm cutting through a little better. This is a pretty easy case. And so we just uh, save the, the steps and move right through that cutting guide there. Again, I'm a big fan. You know, if those of you that are a fan of the ballistic nylon guides, they will come with the set. You don't have to special order that, and you don't have to use those metal cutting guides. So if that's your technique you've developed and honed over the over the months and years, then you can continue with that technique and have that assurance. We've just done some value-added additions. We prepared the top of our, our tibia, and now we're going to do some trialing. Osteophytes have been removed. The menisci have been removed at this point. This is a little technique that we use for CR needs. I palpate the, the PCL and the collaterals. My assistant holds the bone hook up at 95 degrees. And I should be able to just glide that, uh, that tibia in. It should make contact. If I have to push it, traditionally that's ended up in a knee that's too tight. Now, there is a step here. I'm going to have Lauren pause. As I want to point out, not yet, I'll let you know. Let's keep rolling through that. So this is a, an enhanced uh, tibial alignment guide. Once we've got the trial in, we can use our drop rod, and that's a nice uh, stable. Here's our oval patella. We have a better gratifying fit, and as Will uh, pointed out, we've... Um, Increase the thickness, it's between one and two millimeters, depending on the size of the oval. And um, I think you'll all be pleased. Now, this is stop this right here. Okay, get so the sound. Yeah, so this is a new uh, technology. 
I don't know if I can audio. This is a new uh, cutting guide, an alignment guide. So the tower has been elevated to capture both the uh, keel punch and the central drill. And then this will just punch out and we can place right in this uh, guide the, uh, the tibial polyethylene trials excuse me, the tibial ballistic nylon trials. I was, I was trialing there earlier with this, but it's a, it's a beautiful enhancement that allows more, for a better fit and feel of the trialing process with the ballistic nylon uh, implants. So that's just a beautiful enhancement. You've got an additional uh, ability every step of the way to know where you're at and uh, feel that tension that kinematic kind of kick back to how you how you do in the case. So okay Lauren go ahead and roll that forward. All right. So it, this looks better than it looked like I was shooting this with my kids camera phone but now this looks terrific. So there's four pins that you can place here and and uh, this is kind of a standard type of captured tower. We're going to drill through the the central post for the uh, to prepare to advance our keel after this. This has got to stop and you can just drill to where it bottoms out. And then these, uh, these uh, can we stop and show that maybe? Um, so there's serrations. Can you back it up a little bit? Because I don't think we've got a good view. I mean, when we see the keel, stop right there. Stop, yeah, you see the punch. We've added teeth onto the keel punch uh, to give it a little better uh, friction and grab and uh, help us with that sclerotic bone medially and thinner bone laterally, and which is about 85% of the time. So this is an enhanced part of the, cap uh, the new system of identity, this keel punch. Go ahead. It tends to grab better and it doesn't slide. Instrumentation, you see that black hand has also been improved. It's got a really nice feel to it. it feels great in the hand and and I'm very pleased. And Rob, you want to talk about the cement, the stem extensions? Yeah. So at this point, yeah. So at this point, um, through that tower, you would drill um, that drill even farther down, according to whether you want a twenty or a forty. And there's a an adapter in the system allows you to do that. And um, and then I would just select uh, an added stem according to my personal preference, how I feel about stems and how I feel how they enhance stability. Any other point to add to that, Will? No, uh, you have to uh, drill. I think it's a is it like a 15 millimeter uh, boss stem drill, and then and then you drill a 13 millimeter stem distally where this where the stem extension would go uh, and so the stem is 12 millimeter diameter so you'll have a 0.5 millimeter cement male around the distal tip of the stem yeah that's terrific all right very good so we've got it cemented now and here is a, a, a nice addition stop right there if you can so these right there you can see these these two uh, ballistic nylon trials they fit into each other they key into each other First of all, then when they slide in, it's a it's a much more robust, solid, a gratifying feel as those trials lock in and they can replicate the, the it's an enhanced sensation for and uh, we're bringing everybody in their comfort zone. We've had no significant problems with the, the previous locking mechanisms, but this is an enhancement that uh, is very very um well it's just nice to it's nice to feel it's nice to see how these lock in but at the trial phase here a lot of surgeons will actually once they um, are ready to cement they, they'll cement in their their real polys i'm not opposed to that i've just been so pleased with dialing in that last one millimeter of enhancement if i need to that i wait to uh, trial at the very uh, last part of the operation so the cement has been fixed here and um, we're trialing and we've, we've verified it. Here's the e-poly and they, they lock in, it's still the same sequence, 
lateral first, medial second. They just have a nice uh, keyed in fit that has more enhanced feedback there. You can see that a um, little bit of elevation on that rim allows us to achieve that goal. And some surgeons that are comfortable, uh, that like a one piece, they can go right to the one piece that they've ordered. And both uh, systems are acceptable. You know, the, the system is FDA approved for uh, both of uh, uh, asymmetric poly and uh, one piece poly. So here's the, uh, he's one month post-op and doing well. He, he liked his left knee we did a couple years ago and um, very happy to have his right knee done now. Very good, I think those are the salient points of the demonstration. I think we wanna take some questions on, on some of the changes in the system. So we have we've got some experienced users that have joined us and I want to be adding things here. I think it's important to note there's no changes on the femoral component side. The femoral component has, is the same as it was previously. All right. We have a little if anybody has any questions in the audience, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you can type them in the chat and we will read them. Can you hear me? I have a question. Uh, this is Yatin Kirani calling from Syracuse. I had a question about alignment, uh, target alignment. Uh, if one desires to uh, have some residual virus alignment, uh, slight undercorrection of the deformity, as uh, uh, along the restricted, uh, excuse me, adjusted mechanical alignment uh, principles, is it possible to? Uh, that, do you have to tell the engineers that they want a one degree mechanical axis virus in this patient? Well, listen, I think it's a very good question. I'll I'll start. You know, the system is only FDA approved for. Uh, neutral alignment and so we have to achieve that on the tibia uh, the uh, system is planned for that but typically what you'll find is those that want to achieve a kinematic alignment and that uh, native varus uh, patient you'll find that uh, you have to do that modification at the tibia and uh, i do that frequently uh, probably about 15 percent of my varus knees well, anything to add there? No, you can't. You can't uh, ask for a knee to be planned in two degrees of constitutional varus, though. You have to plan it initially in zero degrees, and then make a intraoperative modification, either with your polys or with your tibial cut. Thank you, Doc. Can you guys hear me? Sure can. What's your take on uh, posterior slope, patient matched implant versus fixed five degrees? Uh, pros and cons, what's your thought process? Well, I found sometimes that, I, you know, if they're 18 degrees or pretty high posterior slope, sometimes I think that's pathologic and I'm very leery to, to do the patient matched implant when they're that much. Well, so I, I agree with that. Let me just give you my um, experience and my bias. And this is solely my bias uh, through, because I've tried to achieve or match anatomic posterior slope, uh, even with my off the shelf CR knees over the last couple of decades. So my technique lends to trying to match the posterior slope. The system recommends you do not exceed 10 degrees in any off kind of position uh, from the system, you certainly can do, but that's, um, that's not recommended. You, that's according to your uh, technique. And I agree with some of the, some of the slopes might be inaccurate or pathologic. Sometimes they're very difficult to uh, make accurate if there's been trauma or there's really significant deformity. So you use your best skills, the same skills you use with your off-the-shelf knee. So my rationale is this, that we're, unless there's a severe pathologic abnormality, I'm gonna, I've gone a great effort to re-establish 
the normal J curves in the femur, not adding any rotation or any type of my own secret sauce positioning. I'm going right with where the computer tells me to put it. And we've got these J curves, we re reproduced it, it fits the patient perfectly. Moving on to the tibia, we've got uh, contour in the polyethylene, which attempts to uh, compensate for the loss of an ACL. And so now, um, it didn't make any sense to me to arbitrarily change the slope on the tibia, all variables considered. So uh, now that's my approach. So within that range, I try to uh, respect the patient's native slope on the CR knees. And I believe Will has a little different approach to that. So I'd like to yeah. come in. I'll, I'll tell you, I do the five degree slope on all. I had early on, I've had two knees that I put in. One was about 15 degrees of slope and one was about 12. And they did fine for about three years and then they developed post. If you think about, you know, everything rolls downhill. If you have now an ACL deficient knee and you have 15 degrees of posterior slope, over time that femur will want to start to slide off the back of the tibia. And that's just mechanics. And, and you, we know that from the, the old literature on high tibial osteotomies, if there's an ACL deficient knee, high tibial osteotomies could not, you had to take slope out of the tibia or else it failed miserably. Uh, same thing with, with the ACL uh, deficient total knee replacement. Uh, you can't take the posterior slope beyond about 10 without really worrying about posterior instability long term. It's not something that happens acutely. It's something that happens years later. Um, and so if you are really accurate and you know that you're only going to cut 10 degrees of slope, then I think you're fine. But, you know, if you plan for 10 and you end up cutting 15, you develop late instability. So I cut everybody at five. You know, that's, I mean, it's a really good point because the argument against cutting that native slope is that if you overcut, then it's very difficult to recognize unless you have a C arm in there and then you get that late instability. You know, I, I you know, there's been uh, surgeons that have done more, but I've done over 1,500 of these CR knees uh, over more than a seven year period. We've not seen any late instability in the conformist knees. Uh, in that, in my sub segment, and all of them, except for the first 50, were cut, uh, tried to achieve that anatomic slope. So, just food for thought from my cohort of uh, knees. We have a question in the chat about stem extensions, which is why we're showing the stem extension eye view page. Um, could you please speak about your experience? using the new stem extensions. Yeah, I love it. It's it's simple, um, doesn't take any time. You basically just unscrew the little plastic cap on the end of the stem and screw on the stem extension. So that is simple, it takes 10 seconds. And uh, yeah, I use it on all my obese patients. So I use a 40 millimeter stem. If you're gonna use a stem extension, I don't see any reason to stop at 20 unless you had a crazy slope and you were worried about the longer stem hitting a cortex or something. But um, it's been very simple and, and been a nice value add for my obese patients. I like the stems. I'm glad they're available. They give me great peace and comfort. I haven't had an opportunity to use them yet, though. I think uh, one of the things by on my CR knees, the previous G2, the only thing that uh, troubled me on occasion was just the small stem and the small keel. And so by increasing that keel, both width and depth, that's a, that 50 millimeters is really a nice sweet spot. And I found that myself being satisfied with the stability with that keel so far. But I know in the uh, BMIs uh, between 40, 45, that's, that's on my, that's on my uh, watch list, a uh, very low threshold to employ that. I'm trying to send those over to Will to operate on. I'm trying to avoid those. That's right. <laughs> There's enough to go around. <laughs> Any other questions from the group? 
Somebody just popped up a question on the marketing aspect of uh, on your practice. Uh, yeah, I would say most patients who come see me um, is, uh, you know, they're coming to me because of conformists. So, you know, most people already know that I do conformists in my market. So that's pretty uh, understood. And I think that's a large, largely driven just the patients uh, seeking out this technology. There's one other question about the asymmetry of the bench. Can you guys put that question up again? It flashed, but I couldn't quite see it. Maybe I can hit it and see it. What I'm reading from, from Rob is that a femur flange is now asymmetric. Is that correct? So uh, it hasn't changed from G2 plus to identity because there weren't any changes on the femoral side. Um, it is, uh, I, I don't believe the the thickness of the metal and the uh, flange has changed. It, and it's not, that part's not patient specific, but the overall shape of it is. My trick. Yeah, so I can, I can jump in. So the flange is asymmetric on our PS identity knee, or PS I total knee. And that same shape has been carried over to identity both CR and PS. And you can see that asymmetric flange in this post-op x-ray we have on the screen. Any other questions from the group? I think I probably close to 100, maybe 250 or so of the identities. And I, I love the changes. I was, just to be all honest, I was a little skeptical that the metal cutting guys would make a difference. And, and just to be truly honest, I was not pushing for those. I was like, I don't really care if I have a metal cutting guide or not. But having used the metal cutting guides, I've been amazingly impressed with how much of a difference it makes uh, and really, really surprised. Uh, so I was a doubter, but uh, it came through and I actually love the new system and love the new drop rods. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. I was, uh, that wasn't on my wish list, but you know, it's surprisingly uh, the the treatment cutting guides, the precision of the bolts, uh, and how that locks in, and it's the precision of the of the guide. I'm, how quick that is! You just snap it off and, and go. And so uh, traditionally, I'd always have to do a recut distal femur, and uh, these are just sailing right through. So I think uh, I I was with you, Will. Um, there's a question, but really a supporter of it now. There's a question about when's the CR identity going to be released to everyone? Can you handle that? Yeah, where are the market guys? So we are in a limited launch with CR identity right now. We are expanding that launch. So if anybody has interest in using the product right now, please reach out to your sales reps and they will put you in touch with us. Um, it will be available widely early this summer. So within the next month, it will launch first with CR only and then PS will be available by the end of the summer. We also had a question come through about if you to feel there's any advantage in micro motion with the one piece poly over two piece. Well, I'm talking theoretical, yeah. sure. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's theoretical, so I don't, we'd have to, have to access our engineers and the bench testing they did with it. I don't think there's any difference actually. Not a very satisfying answer for you guys, but right now the system <laughs> is designed. It's a high precision system with a one or two. Yeah. 
I, I will say this. Anybody that's had concerns on their CR knees with a dual poly, and once in a while, you look at those and, and you can envision them flipping out. Um, I totally get it. Um, we haven't had that issue if you uh, pay, you know, just a good technique there. But it's much more satisfying to put these uh, new locking mechanism, these new polys in. It really has that really tight grip that you're used to with the, uh, some of the other systems. And so uh, I think you'll be very pleased with the enhancements. Even those of you that continue with asymmetric polys that you want to change them out, uh, I think you'll, you'll be very, very pleased with the enhancements done there. You just have to kind of feel them to see them. So I'm not seeing any more questions come in at this time. So if Dr. Tate, Dr. Kurtz, you'd like to share kind of your final thoughts on your experience with the system so far. Well, I think it's awesome. I'm hungry, actually. Um, we all do that. One of the things that we didn't really discuss on very much is the titanium. I really like the feel of the titanium. It is lighter. Uh, which I never really thought I would have perceived, but I actually was pretty impressed. It is a little bit lighter. Um, and I really think the cement rail is rock solid. Um, I think the dovetail in the cement rail makes a huge, makes a nice benefit as well as, um, as well as just moving it out to the periphery is just going to increase the overall cement mantle better. So uh, I think, and, and I think the tibial keel being and, and, and uh, post being longer, bigger just like the ps knee i think that's also a real big value add so i think uh i think those are the main benefits uh still the same great surface technology in terms of matching the articular surface to the anatomy uh and just basically mostly improved tibial fixation uh with the identity We have one more question that came in. Are all identity components titanium? Uh, at this point in time, the femur is still cobalt chrome. The tibia is titanium for identity. Yeah. Somebody said, how many custom total knees have you done? I've also, I've done probably 15, 1600. Um, so. I've been doing it for so, a I, I know that we've done over 1,500 of these, uh, Brian, question from Brian. And, you know, the large majority of those are, have been CR. But, you know, that I had adopted a uh, PS use with my BMIs. I just, it was an arbitrary thing, went 40 to 45. And when their BMIs over 45 to 50, then I use conventional implants that have uh, stems. And I... My cutoff, nobody gets an operation if they're BMI for 50. That's my experience. So in that 40 to 45, I, those people got a PS knee just because of the size of the keel. That was my only selection criteria. So this, I'm, I'm very happy with the, both the addition of the key things, locking mechanism, the cement rail, and then that extended keel. Now, to respect uh, the patient's anatomic slope and so I see myself using less of the stems because um, you know they'll kind of get in the way of the 10 degree slope on some of these patients. So that's uh, that's just been my, uh, my my take on it. Femur is just perfect and the, I, I will say on that metal cutting guide uh, I every single one of my ballistic nylon uh, guides, I would just plan on a second cut. I'm just going to go first one cut uh, trial with the um, that uh, the old guide from the system for the gap balancing, and then I would go into uh, another cut. Uh, I found uh, I'm doing a second cut only about uh, a third of the time now, so that's uh, a nice feature, and I'm very picky about that disaphragmal cut. I mean. I mean, I'm thinking about everything, but you know, that's a that's a big thing for me. You know, I, I, once that cuts perfect, I think the operation's over because everything's going to come into place on those J curves on the femur. Uh, tibia cuts a little less accurate, and I can dial that in, and I can do some fine tuning there. And I've got asymmetric polys to really kind of take it across the finish line. So I'm I'm really happy with 
these enhancements, it's going to bring more of my cases back into my comfort zone with a CR approach. Well, thank you, everyone. If there's no further questions, I'd like to conclude our webcast for the evening. Thank you, Dr. Hurt. Thank you, Dr. Tate. Uh, if you have any further questions, please contact your local sales representative or reference our performance webpage. Thank you for joining. Thanks, guys. Yeah, bye-bye now.